Thanks, Michael. Um, now that I know the influence I've had over your career, I'm thinking I should probably charge you with tax. <laughs> yeah. Um, considering the growth you've had, um, I think I deserve a cut. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks for all those who joined. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Um, I was saying to Michael that I'm quite new at this, so I'm looking to get a good experience and to carry you along. You're going to be special because you're going to be amongst the first crowd that I'm addressing and sharing my wise words um, as I am right now. So I thought the best place for me to start is by telling you about myself. So ignore the picture that was used in the poster. Um, this is how I really look like. Um, as you can see on the slide, yeah, the, that's, a, that's the honest, um, my, how I look like. The other one was um, a little bit uh, done up. Um, when I'm not, um, when I'm not, my full-time job is um, um, raising two boys. Um, I'm raising them from boys to men, yeah, all pun intended on that one. Um, I love reading. I'm currently rereading uh, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Yeah, I like to read um, a lot of fiction as opposed to um, self-help books. Yeah, uh, this is because um, um, I like traveling to different places when I'm reading books. And there's also something that you enjoy about reading the literature. Um, uh, if I'm reading a self-help book, I actually read it like I would read um, uh, school books. So I'd constantly, I'll, I'll quickly read through and get to the actual points that I'm looking for in the book. Um, I'm passionate about uh, building relationships. Um, I think relationships actually are the key to getting to wherever you want, uh, wherever you want to go, and getting to getting whatever you want. So I'm passionate about building relationships and sometimes breaking relationships where they're not adding value to my life. So um, I, I love people, and therefore building relationships with people then goes hand in hand. Yeah, so I'm happy to be here chatting to you guys, um, obviously at the invitation of the Grozania CEO we've just met. Um, so um, I'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. And as we proceed, I will be... I will be responding to them, especially if they're relevant to what I'm talking about. So today I am talking to you about how not to ruin your career. Um, that's just because nobody likes failing. Um, I've never met anybody who's actually getting into something to fail. So I don't think any of you um, or anyone uh, goes to school to get a degree, to um, study, put in all that work, getting references um, for you to fail. Yeah, so there's a lot of work that we put into our careers to fail. And this is the one um, quote that got to me when I was thinking about failure. Yeah, um, if you can't do, um, I cannot do everything, but I can do something. I must not fail to do the something that I can do. So it's just basically for us to talk through and see what it is that we can do to avoid uh, the common pitfalls that would uh, affect our careers. Yeah. So if we move to the next topic. So how I'll be doing this today is um, through the, um, it's a three part series. I'll be talking about how, when you get in, um, how you get in, um, how you stay in and then how you get out. So it will basically be, I came, I saw, I conquered. Yes, we couldn't be uh, more imaginative. And so we just uh, stole with pride. So um, I think let's just start at the beginning. Um, so I'll talk about how you present yourself and this is your CV. Yes, your CV is kind of like what we'd call your face. If you are going into a dating show or um, a dating platform, your CV is, the, is your face. Yeah, it's what it's what would be, uh, you'd be reaching out or what would be the things that attracts you to an organization. So um, 
the first thing that you need to do um, as a, uh, when you're preparing your CV is to leave out the personal details. Um, so I've worked as a recruiter previously and some of the things that I, uh, that make me cringe my face is when I see people putting in their age, their marital status, yeah. Some of these things, unless you're applying or you're joining, um, you're applying for a date to uh, make an app to be a contestant in a dating show or it's a Tinder application, um, it's things that you don't need to put. Um, your religion, again, unless you're applying to become a choir uh, lead in your church, some of these things. Um, some of these things could actually deter you from getting to where you want to go. And I understand that it's personal and those are the values that you have and that's the thing that you really like about yourself. But um, it could be what then causes for you to be discriminated against, yeah? Most organizations have the... Um, most organizations believe in and, and apply the law where somebody shouldn't be discriminated based on age, gender, or otherwise. But remember that an organization is not the recruiter, it's an individual and we are human beings, so biases are going to be there. So these are things you should leave out of your CV. Um, the next thing, the, the other big pitfall that comes from candidates or people when they're applying for jobs is when they have very long CVs. Yeah, um, I googled it, and um, it's something you could also do. The average time a recruiter takes to look at a CV is six seconds. Personally, as a recruiter, I've taken less time, especially when I'm recruiting for those massive jobs. Like if you're recruiting for graduate trainees or management trainees, you know there's nothing that is going to be special. Um, you're looking for someone with a degree, um, with in some probably internship experience. So. The average time it takes a recruiter to look at your CV is six seconds. So unless you want a recruiter to spend their six seconds looking at your mission statement. You have had people who have a mission statement, other people have a purpose statement, and then you have put your personal details as well there. So half the page is just a information that does not help or add value into you getting the job. Yeah, so... Um, and to be honest with you, as a recruiter, especially in the in Kenya, um, or maybe let's say Africa, because I've also interacted with recruiters across Africa, it's a lot, you get a lot of applications. Um, I advertise and I want to recruit two people and I'll get over 10,000 CVs, yeah? I'm not going to spend uh, time looking through your papers to find the necessary information that I'm looking for, the information that I would use then to, shortlist you so if it's a job and it's looking for people with a minimum uh, degree your degree should be on the first page of the application if it's looking for experience and your experience should be on the first page there are rarely any jobs that would require for you to have a purpose statement or a mission statement when you're applying so as much as possible even if you want to include them make uh, try and minimize this and make them as few uh, and make and make your most relevant experience appear on the first page yeah so that's the uh, so the first thing I said was about uh, your personal details I've talked about the long CVs the next thing that I see it um, I see candidates making a mistake uh, by putting on their CVs is putting your job description in your CV. So you will say you're a marketing manager, for example, and then you will go on and post the job description that was used to recruit you on the CV. Yeah. Um, that's a little bit generic. Um, it also doesn't have any impact. You uh, acting in a certain role with your job description does not mean that you've been doing that, those exact um, things that has, has described in the job description. And so I would advise that um, in your job description, in the where you put your title and you have the details of what you do, that you put things that you've actually been able to achieve. Yeah. So I'll give an example. If you're applying, um, if you're a personal assistant, um, talk about how you have been able to cut, uh, and part of your work is managing budgets. Talk about how you've been able to cut um, budgets and savings and able to achieve savings. Talk about um, things that you've 
accomplished in your role. It also works for you because when you attend an interview, it becomes a conversation starter. Your interviewers will probably ask, how were you able to cut these costs? Um, how did this translate into savings? What were some of the things that you were able to accomplish in that state in, uh, for you to be able to achieve in this stage? Um, in that achievement that you've listed there, as opposed to uh, writing responsible for budgets, responsible for responsible for budgets, responsible for calendar scheduling, you know, put things that you've been able to accomplish. If it's calendar scheduling, talk about the way you were able to drive efficiency and better still, if you can quote a number to it, uh, nothing speaks better uh, than uh, having uh, having whatever you have, what, whatever you're quoting there in with a number attached to it. Yeah. So the final thing I'll talk about when you talk about you coming to the um, under I came would be uh, taking yourself, taking the job interview seriously. And recently I was um, uh, being in the digital uh, stage that we are in now. I think this is a digitization stage more than we've ever experienced it before and working from home. So we are having candidates have uh, applying and interviewing digitally. Yeah, we use an application called HireView. And I've seen I have been watching videos because I'm actually in the process of recruiting for a position and I've had these candidates come on and it's actually, it's embarrassing. I think for me as a recruiter, I, I, I feel like I would, you, you would go, you'd reach out into your laptop and talk to this guy and tell them the things they need to do. I've seen people attend interviews in their, um, um, because it's you assume that it is an it is an it's 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 a digital interview, therefore you don't need to make an impression. I've seen people attending their sweatpants, um, not taking it seriously, talking as though they would be talking to their friends in school, or even your mates at home. There's a there's a guy who was talking and I just felt like he was he was attending an interview, but he was seated in a bar talking to his friends because he was snapping his hands, clapping them and repeating. It's very, um, and it was very uncontrollable and um, it was painful for me to watch. So uh, take your interview whenever you call for an interview seriously, prepare, practice and understand your CV. I know it is your CV and you own it. What I personally like to do is whenever I'm attending an interview is I write down words that I want to use or things that I want to stress out. So um, if I'm talking about my role, I'll talk about, for example, recruitment. And then I'll quickly mention my biggest achievement and I'll have numbers attached to it. So when I'm asked to tell me about yourself or tell me what you do in your current role, I already have it written down. Yeah. Sometimes this may not be possible because you're attending a face-to-face -face interview and you don't want to be reading through or uh, skimming through some written work. The best thing for you to do then is to read through your CV, understand it. Yeah. And then practice yeah there are common questions that you ask tell us about yourself um what's your greatest achievement uh, what are your weaknesses what are your strengths these are questions that most likely will come through um so read through your cv understand it own it that if you're woken up at night you can literally uh, read through your cv um, or talk through your cv and uh, be able to present yourself as you should yeah, um, anytime when you're answering questions at the interview phase, especially those questions where they're sort of scenario questions, tell us about a time when you were able to uh, cut costs. Just going to give you an example. So you can tell what's going on in my life right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm all about cutting costs. So at this the thing that you should um, the thing that you should talk about at this stage is about uh, use the star approach. Yeah, so you talk about the situation that you are in. For example, you are given a target of cutting costs by 
um, this percentage, talk about the, that's the situation, talk about the tasks that were involved, talk about the actions that you took, and then finally the results. So structure it um, so that it flows sequentially and you're not jumping up and down from one point to the other. Yeah, that's called the STAR approach. Um, you could always Google it and find out more about it. Um, and it's a good thing to use. Yeah, so that's just um, highlights of what you need to do or certain pitfalls that people get into that either prevent them from getting into the door or get them into the door and then they can't progress any further. Um, that's affecting their chances of even having, start, uh, having them start in their career. Um, I'll probably answer a few questions, then we'll move to a poll. Um, um, huh. So I've seen a few questions. Um, I guess the first one that we'll start with is uh, an anonymous one where somebody asked, uh, what about cover letters? Are they any good? What's your take on that? Um, to be honest with you, as a recruiter, I never read cover letters. <laughs> they never have any information that helps me to shortlist for the position. So. Um, let's talk about job descriptions. When job descriptions are being, when we are not, when you're advertising for jobs, we'd say we want the minimum requirements requirements for you to have a degree, for you to have some certain length of experience, and uh, for you to have certain skills. Yeah. Um, I have six seconds, or I'm looking through ten thousand applications. I'm not going to spend my time looking at cover letters. Yeah. So unless an organization has specifically asked for a cover letter. Um, I wouldn't see the need of attaching it. So for me, I I can't remember the last time I read a cover letter, to be honest. Okay. That's good to demystify that. I, I think uh, one more question that we have is, uh, Maureen has asked, uh, does it mean we have to write uh, different types of CVs depending on the different requirements uh, based on experience, minimum qualifications, etc.? Yeah, and it depends with the kind of um, it depends with the kind of opportunity you're looking for. So um, I'll speak from my own personal experience, and then I'll give you another um, uh, viewpoint. Personally, I only have one CV, and I don't alter it for any um, for any application I make. And this is because I am I, I have a vision of what I want, and it's not changing based on applications that come by. So I'm not personally applying for any job. I'm only applying for jobs that um, suit me and my purpose and what I want right now. And therefore, um, my CV as it is, is already working towards that. So I wouldn't be changing my CV because my CV is already uh, aligned to what I'm looking for and I'm not, but on the other hand, especially if you're starting out in your career or uh, you're looking to switch careers, then it would help to have different CVs for different occasions because you are applying for different things uh, often. So if you're looking to move, for example, from HR to marketing, you will probably want to call out the things that are more marketing inclined in your CV as opposed to the HR things, because that's where you're looking to get into. So that's the achievement that you'd want to bring out. So uh, for example, you don't talk about employer branding more, um, or you don't call out achievements related to employer branding more because you're looking to move into marketing. Um, but personally, because I am very focused in the career journey and the career path I want to take, my CV is the same because the, I'm only applying to things that make sense to the to what I want and therefore my CV is crafted for that. So that depends on what you're looking for. Thanks for that. I think the second part to that question is, um, is it relevant to indicate your current responsibilities and your achievements as well? I think that one we've already answered, but maybe just yes. reiterate, yeah. Um, I, 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 I'm more impressed when I see somebody has written their CV and has and they've talked about their um, achievements as opposed to key responsibilities, yeah? Because the roles and responsibilities of the role might be there. You performing on those roles and responsibilities are totally different thing. So when you put in your achievement, I'm able to then see that not only do you have these roles and responsibilities, but you're actually achieving on them, yeah? And like I said, it's a conversation starter. Um, if you put there that you are able to recruit, a five 
uh, directors within 10 years of your HR career, the first thing I'll ask you is, how did you do it? You know, you already have a conversation start and you're not starting for, from tell us what you do in your current role. I am already seeing the results and achievements that you've written down. Perfect, thank you for that. Um, one very popular one, and I guess uh, it's one that comes up a lot is um, the question, tell us about yourself. How do you answer that question? Oh gosh, <laughs> there's a guy I interviewed. Uh, well, he was pretty junior in his um, career. He was starting out his career and he started telling us about how he loves his mom. And <laughs> so it was very awkward for us because yes, you want, to, yes, it's okay that he loves his mom, but uh, quite not what you're looking for in an interview. So whenever you're asked to tell us about yourself, uh, we what you're basically being asked is talk us through your CV. Um, so, and for me, uh, but this is me, um, I like to personalize it and, and talk about myself as an individual first. So I'll talk about um, having grown up in Nairobi, um, that I have uh, two sons and I'll talk about my personal life, but that will just be like a one liner. And then I'll move on to my education. I'll move on to my work experiences. And then finally, I will end with what I'm currently doing. And this is where I go through now the details of the, you remember the things I told you that you write down? I'll talk through the, those things that I've written down. Yeah, so um, it doesn't mean that you don't talk about yourself because at the heart of everything, you're a human being. Um, so you can talk about yourself, but that is only to be one line and then focus more on your education, your skills, and most importantly, the thing that you're currently working on now, what you're doing now. Uh, this is a time for you to boast and blow your tam trumpet as much as possible, but only in the area related to your professional life. At least that should take 80% of what you when or even 90% when you're answering that question. The 10% is when you talk about yourself and don't go into nitty gritties about loving your mom or loving your dog. Yeah. Um, just talk about things that are authentic to you. So don't talk about um, loving to travel and you probably don't travel. Talk about things that are authentic to you. Um, so for me, for example, I mentioned that I have, um, I, I mentioned uh, just like what I've mentioned when I introduced myself. Yeah, the fact that I love reading books, the fact that I have kids and um and yeah, that I love building relationships, but did you see how short that was? And I am taking the rest of my larger portion of the time assigned to me to talk about what I'm actually here to talk about, which should be your skills and experience. Thank you for that. I think one thing that I also once read somewhere is also maybe to answer that question about, tell me about yourself, is also to say what's not in your CV, which you highlighted a lot of um, the, the way you grew up, how that has shaped who you are. Um, mm. Yeah, and thank you for that. So the other question is from uh, Ms. Washira who's was asking, what is the ideal length, for example, in bullet points of the previous accomplishment section? Um, how long oh, should, so, yeah, in terms of bullet points, how many should you put for your accomplishments? Should you put a hundred of them or do you sharpen the list? Um, I'd say um, a maximum of 10. I did, uh, personally, I'd like five because I won't read through the 10. But if you're putting, even if it's 10, make sure that your top accomplishment or achievements are at the very top. Remember the six minutes rule. Um, you, that way you want to ensure that whoever is looking through your CV or wanting to know your previous experience is reading it within the first um, few seconds of looking at that piece of um, what you've written there. So whatever is your greatest achievement or whatever you think for sure will get you the opportunity should be within the first uh, bullets of what you put in there. Thank you. I think that's that's a brilliant way. Um, and then we have a lady by the name Vivian who's saying, wow, great introduction. I think this is uh, from when you introduced yourself. Uh, she says that she never knows what is relevant when introducing herself. So she must have learned something new there. So some good uh, feedback. You can you use there. the same. You can use the same uh, to introduce yourself when you go for interviews and they ask you, um, tell us about yourself. Yeah. That's great. And then uh, Carol is asking, how many pages are recommended for a CV? I think that's that's a brilliant question as well. 
um, you can have as many pages as you want. Just make sure that whatever you want to uh, or whatever has been advertised or whatever the requirements are are showing on the first page of your CV. Yeah, I would personally, if you'd ask me, I'd say a maximum of two. Uh, but whatever you want to communicate, whatever you want to be known, if you want it to be known that you have a degree, it should be on the first page and amongst the first part of your CV. Yeah, remember, six seconds is a very long time for you to be screaming skimming through the next page. So whatever you want to put, ideally you should have your name, your contacts at the top there. And then if you want to list the skills that you have, so you can talk about, for example, your um, you can operate SAP, that should be there, or you're good, um, you're able to work on off a certain system, you should put that there. And then quickly move to your, depending on what you're applying for, if you're, if you're a fresh graduate, your education should be at the top bit and then then your experience if it's internship if you're a seasoned um job seeker then ideally you should quickly move from your skills and the next should be your experiences yeah and then um at the end is where you put your education because uh, if i'm looking for somebody like a marketing manager i want to know have they been a marketing manager before then i'll be like oh by the way have they do they have a degree have they done this course so i'll go i'll have the time to go through that but ideally, whatever you want to be seen should be on the first page. Uh, don't go more than three pages CV, ideally is two. Uh, yeah, but then as you progress into your career, I guess it will become longer and longer. But the only reason why CVs become long is people put in their roles and responsibilities in the um, previous work experience section. Well, thanks for that. I think um, I just want to pause there. Um, I do see a few more questions that we have, um, requesting that we'll answer those at the very end. Um, just want to do a quick poll, just to, just a temperature check where we are. Um, I guess you should see that on your screen. The first uh, question is, how long do recruiters take to look at your CV? I think uh, Annelise mentioned what's, what the time is, and she even asked that she, you know, if we can challenge it and and find a different number on Google, she'll give you a hundred thousand shillings. Um, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> so how long do recruiters look at CVs? Is it one minute? Is it three minutes? Um, I can see a few answers started coming in, most people saying six seconds. And then the second one is what is the best way to showcase your previous roles on your CV? Is it roles or responsibilities or is it your achievements? And then the last one is what details are necessary on your CV? Um, you know, just tick all the ones that you think apply in that particular situation. Okay, so great to see that most of us are following. Um, I like that at least here we 100% we of the people are right on the, on the first one. Yes, recruiters only have six seconds to look at your CV. And then what's the best way to showcase your previous roles? So it's definitely, you know, by, by highlighting your achievements and not necessarily your roles and responsibilities. Then what details are necessary, of course, um, put what is relevant and leave out what is not necessarily relevant, like your age, marital status, and your religion. So thanks everyone who's following, I uh, really appreciate that. Then um, I guess we'll move on to the second se session um, for you, Annelies. Uh, like you mentioned, you, you built it into three, you have I came, I saw, and I conquered. Um, yeah, so we have in the I saw section, so over to you, Annelies. So um, congratulations. Um, somehow you managed to make it through the interview room and now you're on the inside. Yeah, so you have been given your desk or you have um, been given your badge, your work badge, and you're starting on your new job or your career. So I'm going to talk through some of the pitfalls that you should avoid. Um, so you've just made it through and the first thing you're doing is onboarding, yeah? So some of the pitfalls that I see at this stage is people taking it lightly. And you know, people will walk around and tell you it's your honeymoon stage. Um, but that's not, it's anything but a honeymoon. And if you think about it, even for married couples, honeymoon, the honeymoon phase is actually a time they go out and get to learn about each other. Yeah, so don't take it lightly. Um, remember that every encounter you're having at this stage is a first impression. Yeah, 
Um, it's um, it's also something that people will constantly. It will it sort of become your trademark. Should you have an an incident or fail to or be fail to do something as you should. So um, an example I can think about is people who come late. So if you're always late for your session, you will be known as a person who comes late for things. Yeah, because you did this during the onboarding phase and you didn't think it was going to be anything major because you've been told that it's a honeymoon stage. So your your interview, your onboarding is just as important as the role. Yeah, How you onboard into the organization is important. At this time, you should take time to listen more. Um, ask as much as you can as well, because this is how you get to know about the business. And last year, uh, during one of the onboardings I did, and we were talking to people about learning, I remember there was uh, one of the new people who came in and um, we told them, and the, they were basically being onboarded and being told to download an app, which would help them learn faster within the organization. And what this person did is they responded and said that they don't have enough space on their phone to accommodate the app. Yeah, It's probably true that they don't have enough space, but the the way it was said it was coming from a space of i don't that's not a priority for me um sometimes it's good to just keep quiet because what happened then is um a few months later and this person was not performing the first thing that somebody mentioned was this is the person who said yeah so it's first impressions people never forget first impressions um i'm sure if i ask around the room now if you can remember the first conversations you had when you went into the organizations you were you were currently in or the relationships that you currently have um you will remember what that person said to you the first time um and usually people tend to remember the bad things yeah people will not remember the good impressions that you made when you joined an organization. So it's um, important that you take your uh, onboarding seriously and that you you remain conscious um, that whatever you are doing is creating an impression that lasts a long time and sometimes can even go over and above your the person that you're making the impression with. Um, I think you've had rumors of somebody who's come and they came and what they were talking about was not rubbing people off the right way. So that's not only the, con the one contact that you're making, but even second degree and third, yeah, you know, it can get to six people in under a minute, yeah, based on the kind of um, how you're presenting yourself. And people never forget i'll tell you that for a fact i've sat in review forums where people talk about how somebody joined the organization that's a year into their job yeah this is a basically it's um it's out of the halo or horn effect based on uh it's usually a pitfall that uh, I, I wouldn't want to say interviewers that say human beings have when they everything you do is impacted by the one thing that you did yeah it could either be positive or negative yeah so that's the first thing the second thing uh, the second pitfall you can have is constantly referring to your previous job i'm guilty of this and um it happens a lot also when you come from an organization where things were um, very organized, there was a system to how things are done, and you move into an organization where this is not the case. So you find yourself um, talking about, you know, in my previous job, you know, um, in my what we used to do. Um, yeah, so it can become offensive especially to the people that you're talking to because the question they'd want to ask you so why did you leave your previous organization you'd have just stayed there if it was that great um it also gives the impression that as, as though you're saying that um the people you're working with now are not as informed as your as the people where you're from so that gives a very good it's it it makes the um, it, it gives it gives a bad vibes about what you're saying about the your new colleagues so as much as possible avoid referring to your previous job uh, by all means uh, feel free to apply the lessons or the uh, experiences that you've got from your previous job because there's that some of 
part of the reason why you got the opportunity in the first place. But avoid um, making it um, such that everything that you do is linked to your previous job or all the experiences you have are linked to your previous job. Um, I know somebody was recruited from my previous job into the current um, company that I work for, and they were even complaining about the roofs, the roofs of the building. You know, it's it, it rubs people off the wrong way and you are labeled as that person who doesn't think much of them. Yeah. Um, and then the next thing is the performance. So failing on your commitments, um, not being able to meet or perform in the role that you've been recruited for. And this happens, it's very easy to uh, fail on your commitments. This happens when you don't do what you're required to do or you fail to do what you're, you don't do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. So be very careful when you're making commitments, be very careful when you're creating your goals. Yeah. Uh, on them and uh, remain accountable to yourself even before being accountable to your boss or the organization. Yeah. Um, it's important that you do this because um, usually you fail to perform in a role because um, you don't either own those goals, you've not accepted that, that, you're, that they're your goals, or you did not commit uh, fully aware of the commitment that you're making. Yeah, um, It's very easy to do this. I usually say that when you have a big goal, you break it into smaller goals that you can constantly uh, track. And in achieving the small goals, you achieve the bigger goal. Um, as you continue to achieve them, make sure you're keeping your line manager in the loop. There's no line manager who likes surprises, um, uh, much less surprises that affect their performance because now you're not only affecting your performance, you're affecting their performance. So um, uh, personally, I say to people when they join organizations, your line manager is your coach, um, have sessions with them every week or every two weeks, keep them updated especially when things are bad. Yeah, let them know when things are bad more than when things are good. Good things they'll get to know either way, but the bad things, you need to call them out and call them out early so that the surprises, the surprises are managed or you get help to help you get through that particular situation. Um, I think the final thing I'll talk about being in the position is to remain authentic. Yeah, avoid putting up... Um, a face of a person that you're not, and as much as possible, do not try to fit in. Um, there's a reason why they hired you and they didn't hire somebody internally. So it's important that you you avoid being uh, like the way everyone else is in the organization. But as much as possible, keep the work culture. If they like to go out for... If they like to go, for example, for meals outside work on Tuesdays, uh, do that, but do not fit in and become like them. Just be who you are and true to yourself. Yeah. So I think that pretty much says about, um, that pretty much sums up about being in the organization, joining the organization, and how then to survive in that stage. Um, I look through the questions. Um, Michael, you can help me. Yep. So I think um, just one question that has come uh, just now. There are others that we will tackle at the end uh, related to the first one. So Eric is asking um, I have started my HR career, but I lost my job. Um, what should I do to, to add some experience? So he says he lost his job after COVID. Um, most job openings are asking for two years experience, but he only has one. So how does he reimagine himself so that he can be able to get experience and at the same time um, get open into, get an opening into one of the organizations? Um, so um, for you to remain relevant in the career, and first of all, I'm very sorry about the redundancy. I'm conscious that this is happening to a lot of people and um, it's something that you could not have foreseen. So I'm very sorry about that. Um, how I'd say to remain relevant is to 
this is not the time to be choosy about the opportunity that you get. So um, if you can get some volunteer opportunities, get involved in that. Um, if you can get uh, any other opportunity, um, I usually tell people that the secret to getting a job sometimes is just getting your foot into the door. Yeah. Um, it does not necessarily have to be a HR opportunity. Yeah. Um, whatever opportunities there are, uh, get into that and then that you're already inside the door and it's much easier to uh, get your way around once you're inside the door and then thereafter move into something that you're passionate about. So um, that is simply what I'd say. Um, you can continue looking for HR opportunities, but don't limit yourself to that. Look for whatever opportunity that you can that will get you into the door and also keep you busy and something that will not leave a blank space into your CV. Thank you for that, Annelies. Um, just for everyone, feel free to keep the questions coming. We'll answer them as we go as well. Um, so we have one question here from Beryl who's asking, how do you handle a situation where what you are sold in terms of the role and the expectations is not what you actually got when you joined the organization? It's basically a case where the role was sold to you. Um, so I've had... Um, <laughs> I've, I've seen this a lot and it's because organizations change. Um, some, uh, in keeping in line with what I talked about being authentic and um, being honest and true to who you are, the first thing you need to do is, well, the obvious thing you need to do is perform the job regardless of the additional responsibilities that have been handed over to you. And then as you're performing the job, so don't drop balls and assume that somehow your line manager will figure it out and remove those responsibilities from you. You need to continue doing them or do them and then have an honest conversation with your line manager and tell them that this is um, this is where I am now. This is where I joined this organization and this is what I want to do next. Um, some of the things that are falling into my current role are not um, in line with what was advertised or are not uh, part of the, in line with what my future career aspirations are. I am happy to continue doing them even as we look for alternative ways of dealing with that. So, and it would be even better if you're the one who's coming up with suggestions of how they can be done. Yeah. Um, but most importantly, do not stop doing what you has been assigned to you and do not sulk while doing it. Yeah, I've seen people who have come in and they're told to do, let me tell you the worst job to do if you're a HR person um, or the thing that uh, really annoys people is, for example, let me talk about recruitment is um, responding to candidates after the application or filing. <sighs> yeah. And um, in my previous, uh, my previous experiences, I remember there was a time where there was a backlog of filing in the filing room. And we were all told that we have to pitch in and put in two hours to do the filing. Oh, terrible time for me. But I think what helped us um, and us as a group, because we were doing it as um, a team, is you came up with the solution of uh, getting the job outsourced, yeah, and coming up with a filing technique. So we made it easy for my boss to understand that this is actually not our um, job, and this is how it can then be done. Yep, that's what I'd advise. Thank you for that, Annelies. Um, I think we, I'm seeing a few more questions coming, so keep them coming, everyone, and we'll answer them. Um, one more question is uh, from Esther, who's asking, what's the best answer to give an interview panel when the panel requires why you left your previous company, yet um, it could have been a retrenchment or uh, some form of redundancy? In the case of a retrenchment or redundancy, the best thing to do is to tell the truth, yeah? Um, and it's very, uh, the, uh, it's a one, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a simple answer to that. Uh, companies do background checks. And one of the questions we ask when you're doing background checks is why Esther left XYZ organization. 
it's better that you know you are you are you are retrenched than you have told us another story and you find out another story because that questions your integrity. Um, I've recruited somebody who told me they were um, they were they are they are they are they were terminated from the organization because the organization uh, found out that he had a relative in that same organization. So you know when you work in banks, you can't be related to anyone in that organization. So that person was terminated, and it didn't in any way impact the decision to hire him because we hired him. And one of the things that we recognize is that he was honest because what would have happened is we'd have done a background check and we find out the truth and then we question all his whole integrity. Um, it happens, also this is a very small world we live in, yeah? People know you and people talk about you. So honesty is always the best policy and let the recruiters or the interviewers make the decision with the honest truth so that you're not always hiding behind this lie or avoiding this lie. Thanks for that, Annelise. And I think the, the theme that I really see coming out from your conversation is about being yourself and being authentic. So just um, reiterating that for, for everyone as well. So Carol has a question here where they're asking, how do you capture career gaps in the CV? Like for instance, you could have been fired, you could have been entrenched, and it took you a long time before you get you go to another job. So how do you capture those career gaps in your CV? Just, <laughs> as I've said before, let them be career gaps. Um, I, ideally, it would, have, it would be good if you didn't have career gaps, but there are career gaps. And um, the one thing that you don't want to be doing at an interview or on your CV is lying, yeah? Um, more and more organizations are coming to value integrity. Uh, so uh, just be honest about why there are career gaps. So if you took time, for example, you took time out to go and become a parent or to become a mother, that's what happened. And that's what you explain. Um, if you are retrenched, I know some of these things we can't, um, and it's not good to lie about them because imagine throughout your entire career, you will be trying to hide the fact that this one thing happened or you're trying to always cover up for it, which doesn't add value for you, to be honest. Um, the best thing I'd say is be honest and yeah, let your integrity come through. Thank you. Thank you, Annalise. Um, just for, for everyone, I think um, I have seen all the questions that have come in, a lot of good ones that, that I want us to, to also spend a few more minutes on. Um, but just for, for the sake of everyone, I'll ask that we go to the next part. So just a, one quick question um, for, for everyone. So just from what Annalisa spoke about, uh, what are some of the pitfalls that you should be looking to avoid when um, you're you know, after you've joined an organization, what are some of the pitfalls that could really um, ruin your, your personality, ruin your integrity? Just a few, just getting a few of your thoughts and making sure that we all understood. So I can say a few people saying, um, you should avoid constantly referring to your previous job. Um, you should avoid failing on your commitments, which that we need to make our work solid. So that's important. Um, I think authenticity and being yourself, we've spoken about that a lot. So be yourself, be authentic. Uh, life happens, uh, retrenchments happen, people get fired. It's always good to be honest and the organization will appreciate that. And also lastly, people also, um, I think Annalise is also talking about not making everyone happy. So there's the tendency that when you join an organization, it's easy for you to, to want to make the boss happy, be the boss's pet. Um, it's not necessary because you know you could end up uh, working against you because your other colleagues could, could think uh, negatively about you and could set you up badly. And at the same time, you know it, it, it you know it's good to be authentic. If if that's not you, just be yourself. Don't try to make everyone happy by doing stuff that's not for you. So thanks everyone for that. Um, I'll just ask that we quickly get on to the last part. Again, please keep the questions coming. We'll definitely answer them. Um, we have some more time for the question and answer at the very end. So what do you analyze on the last part about what to do for your career? Yeah, I conquered it. Yeah, so I conquered is, a, I'm going to be talking about your exit out of the job that you're currently in or um, exiting out of your career, whatever it is. 
Yeah, um, uh, it's an art and I acknowledge it's something that doesn't come natural for Africans. Um, considering how long it takes for us to leave uh, someone's house after a visit. You know, we say goodbye, uh, then you say okay, and then you talk a bit, and then you say goodbye. So by the time you're leaving, um, it's two hours later. So it's something that doesn't come natural for us, maybe even as Africans. So knowing when to leave is actually something that it's something that you need to think about and not just live for the sake of living. So I'm going to make it very short and um, then I'll deal with any questions. So if you're living because of money, um, that's just, it's, it's not going to work. And it's, it's a very bad reason to live. Um, this is because, and if you read about the various motivation theories there are, um, money is usually a hygiene issue. Money is something that um, it, it's good for now, but then it doesn't keep you motivated for longer. And because you'll never have enough, you will have now. And within, I've had people, I mean, I've recruited people who, and I remember this one time I recruited someone who came and he was earning five times more than what he was, he was currently earning at that point. And he signed the letter immediately. And I can trust me, in two months, he was complaining about how much, uh, the amount of money he was paying vis-a-vis -vis what his colleagues were earning. Never mind that two months ago he was not he was earning a fifth of what he's earning now. So um, money is a hygiene is is a hygiene issue. I learned it in school, and I see it every day. And even for myself, I've turned down opportunities that were going to pay me a lot of money. But then I would I felt that that would only take care of that now one of the jobs that I turned down is because the company had a bad culture. And I thought to myself, yes, I'll earn this money, but I probably, it's not sustainable. I will not stay in that organization for as long as I, um, as I want, because I'll want to leave that situation. It's a messy situation. Um, quitting because you're in a tough situation. Yeah. So you always quit when you know that your current employer will give you a counter offer. Quit while you're at the top. Um, they say quit when you're, at ahead, when you're ahead, but uh, quit when things are, you have accomplished and you have done everything that you were going to, you are required to do in that role. Um, quitting when you're issued a performance uh, improvement plan, when you're put on a disciplinary hearing for performance, I'd say take uh, the time to get a coach and conquer that uh, improvement plan that you have so that you're able to uh, get out of that bad situation and you're not moving out because of problems. So improve your performance and then move out once you've improved your performance. Um, the last thing on why you shouldn't leave is quitting a line manager. Um, I've had a lot of people who have had toxic line managers and they quit. Um, good example I'll give on this is somebody who quit because of their line manager and they had to serve notice for three months. And within those three months, their line manager was actually terminated because of um, how they treat their employees. So you've quit because you have a line manager, but your line manager has been terminated and you cannot withdraw your resignation. So to be honest with you, um, tough it out and don't let someone be the reason why you quit. Yeah, quit because of something else, but not a person. Um, so I, I guess the question you're asking me is when then you should quit, when you should look for other opportunities, what's the right reason? And these are the reasons that you should give also in interviews when you're going for interviews, yeah? Because I know one of the questions that you'll ask is what should you, why should you, what should you say when you're asked why you left your previous organization? So um, when you're no longer learning, yeah? So that's actually the true division, the definition of I conquered, yeah? Um, so you have reached the end point of learning in that particular uh, position that you're in and there's none that is forthcoming. Uh, when you've successfully prepared a successor, yeah, um, this is especially in situations where um, you are, uh, because for me, what I do is when I've started a role, I actually start thinking about my exit plan. And that would mean preparing somebody to take over after me so that you make it easy for you to also exit. Um, when it's affecting your well-being, yeah, this is not, this is a no-brainer. Work shouldn't kill you. Yeah, so don't, don't, that is nothing to, that's something that we shouldn't even be negotiating or talking about. 
And finally, the best reason for you to leave um, an organization is when you have left a legacy in the role that you're doing. So when somebody says, this is this is this was Michael's doing, this is something that Michael was able to do, or Michael accomplished this in 2007, and that is why, and then after that, he left and went to become this. There's nothing as um, big as leaving a legacy, that's self-actualization. And that's a good reason enough to quit. Yep, so that's some of the, um, that's my entire presentation in full. Um, I hope you've gotten tips on why you shouldn't, uh, how not to ruin your career, or rather how to then um, propel it um, and grow in your career. Uh, Michael, I'm seeing we're out of time. Um, I don't know how you suggest that we proceed. I think we can, we can, uh take a few more minutes just to answer the last questions that we have if that's okay, okay with everyone um so first of all thank you very much Annelies. um this has been a wonderful session um for myself i've also learned a few new things that i didn't know um i think the the first question that i that i just want to to tackle as to tackle with the one from Dino who's asking how about quitting when you realize your boss is, is toxic I just saw the, the, the question pop in before you spoke about um, you know, toxic like managers, but I, um, I think it's, it's important just to reiterate, um, is it the right thing to quit on your voice when your boss is toxic or what is the right? Um, I'll, I'll, a toxic line management is a whole other issue. So be sure to tell Michael if you want me to come back again and talk about uh, how to deal with a toxic line manager. Yeah. Uh, but personally, I wouldn't uh, quit because of a toxic line manager. I don't like to quitting things because of people. Um, the good thing about human beings, unlike buildings, they move. Yeah, um, I'd quit for another reason, but a toxic line manager. It's a very bad decision to make. And uh, this, th there are different ways you can deal with a toxic line manager. Uh, but don't quit fundamentally because of a toxic line manager. Thank you for that. I think one question here from, um, from Julie, she's asking, how best do you choose your referees? Um, choose your referees. Um, I'd say um, you choose your referees from people you've worked with, so people who can actually comment to, comment to your work and can comment positively. <laughs> um, and people who so usually it's good if you can have a line manager or somebody you work with closely because some of the questions you ask when we ask when you're when we are talking to a reference is about the accomplishments you've made you've and also the failures that you've made or some of your weak points that you've made so um if you've not worked with this person, they will not know how to answer this question, which then questions the credibility of that person as a reference. Because one of the conversations will, uh, one of the things that we'll ask is uh, how, for example, you performed in that role and what were some of the weaknesses that you had in performing that role. So if you, if you have chosen um, someone who you've not worked closely with, they will not be able to answer this question. So choose someone you work closely with, preferably, preferably your line manager or a stakeholder. Definitely not your friend or your ally in the office, especially if they are not people who can speak. Because sometimes you really go deep. Eh? Someone will tell me that they did this and I'll question how, what happened, what did they get? So if they're not able to answer that, then their credibility as a referee goes out of the window. Thank you. I think um, <coughs> that also falls in, uh, there was a second part of the question. Um, Amelia asked, is it in order to include your current supervisor as your referee? What is your thought? So long as you've told them, so long as you've told them, so long as you've told them, so long as you've told your current uh, supervisor that you're looking for a job and that you've listed them on your, on your CV and any referee that you put, please seek get their permission to use their um, to to use them as referees on your CV. 
um, um, I'm seeing a question if your line, toxic line manager is causing me health problems like, a, like hypertension. They shouldn't be causing you health problems. That is why you should ask uh, Michael to invite me again here to talk about uh, toxic line managers. But if your health is compromised, um, on a serious note, whatever the... Um, Whatever the what whatever is causing the health problems, whether it is the environment, whether you feel it is the line manager, um, you are needed al more alive than um, dead. <laughs> so uh, your health comes first, regardless of uh, what is causing the health issues. But toxic line managers are not um, as toxic as you are. Um, if you take the if you're able to take control of that situation, which is a whole conversation, it's a one hour or more conversation. It's it's quite detailed, but it's not. It shouldn't be the breaking point of anyone because you can never control who you work with. You might leave that job and you end up with another toxic line manager, or you could be the one who's toxic. <laughs> so <laughs> don't. Um, it shouldn't cause you hypertension. I really like that you could be the toxic employee but you're thinking your line manager is toxic so but yeah if there's health problems involved definitely that could be a reason to consider i think yep. we have a good anonymous question here um somebody is asking is there a time <laughs> limit on how long one can work for an organization is problem? there a time limit no time limit no time limit remember the reasons why you quit an organization do not um do not do not quit do not uh, quit an organization because of time. Like time should not be a factor of your success. Yeah. The same way you don't uh, think about it like when you're eating food, you don't st stop eating food because the time is over. You stop eating because you're full. Yeah. Make sure you've accomplished what you're supposed to accomplish in that job. Personally, you've learned what you are going to learn when you took on that job. You've made the achievements and accomplishments you wanted to make in that role and then quit the job. Not use time to determine when you quit a job. Thank you. Um, I have found a, quite a, a nice question here that I think um, is interesting for a lot of people. Um, so Eric is asking, how do you handle a subjective performance review from your line manager? How do you handle that? The, the performance is subjective because you did not set good goals. Yeah. If you set goals, for example, if you're in sales and you said you're going to achieve uh, 1.5 million in sales, uh, numbers don't lie. If you're in HR and the uh, things cannot be quantified as such, they, they can still be quantified because, for example, if you say you're going to um, recruit 100% close on all the recruitments that you have, I mean, it's either 100% or 80%. There's no subjectivity. So the issue is actually not the subjectivity in performance review, but in subjectivity in how the goals were created. So Thank you create smart goals, measurable goals, friends, measurable goals. Thank you. Um, I think we, we have uh, a few brilliant questions here about um, you know, how to prepare yourself and how to do your CV. So I'll just ask them um, and then you can tackle them one by one. So maybe ask, is it necessary to attach the copies of your certificates when you're applying for a job? And then uh, the second part of the question was, do qualifications matter when applying for the job or experience? Which, which carries the day, is it the qualifications or is it the experience that you have? So I'll start with the first question. Uh, it's not necessary to attach copies of your education certificates, unless of course you're asked to. Um, that's because, like I told you, you get over 10,000 applications and uh, you don't want to be sorting through 10,000 um, degree certificates and, uh, and whatnot. Um, in the organizations that I've worked for, we only ask for your education certificates when we actually decide to hire you. And we ask for them to do reference checking and not so much to check if you've done those things, yeah? So we'll use them for reference checking. Um, it's also important for you to protect your information, guys. It's important for you to protect your information and not share out things that have not been requested for. So information security, uh, protect yourself against that by sharing things that you've not been asked to share. Just the same way that you wouldn't tell people things that you don't want them to know, yeah? 
state it in your CV. If they ask for it, present it, but don't attach it if it's not been required of you. The second part of the question was about uh, what's more important, what carries the day, depends on the job that you're applying for. If you're applying for an experienced role, uh, your experience uh, carries the day. If you're applying for a graduate role, then your qualifications carry the day. Sometimes it's a mix of both, uh, but most of the times it's just as I've explained. Thank you. Um, I think Beryl asked a good question and it's linked to, to the fact that you mentioned that recruiters usually only have about six seconds to, to look at a CV. So she asked, mm -hmm. do you, you know, because of that whole six seconds, do you just look at the job titles to be in the CV screening or what exactly happens in, in those six seconds? I'll just be honest and authentic. Sometimes I just look at job titles and then uh, that's the first uh, level shortlisting. And then later I will go and look about look at what exactly they said they did under those job titles. Yeah. So it's sometimes it happens, but um ideally um the the, the, you, the achievement that you stated is what would carry the day. Thank you. Uh, Vivian asked a, a brilliant question. So she says, you know, consider somebody who's young and uh, they're not passionate about their job that they're doing. You know, is it right for them to quit um, if they think money isn't worth their peace of mind in that situation? Don't quit until you have another opportunity. <laughs> I'm just going to, that's my honest truth. Ideally, people, you'd be told that uh, do what you love and then you'll never have to work a day in your life. But guys, this is Africa. Jobs are not just out there waiting for you. I'd say you continuously seek for the job that you're looking for. And what that would mean is you stay in this role, perform in that role. Because in every opportunity that you have, friends, there's something that you're learning. Yeah, so it's not, don't look at it as something you don't love. Look for the lesson that you're gaining there. Um, and then uh, as you continue to look and when you get something that you have gotten, at least you'll be moving with having learned something or having taken something out of it. So don't quit until you have something else and then look at that opportunity that you have as a learning opportunity. Ask yourself, what am I supposed to learn out of this? What is, what is in this that I'm supposed to be picking? Um, thank you for that, Annelies. Um, there's one question here which I think is a bit, is a bit interesting. Um, Eric is asking, why is it that when you attend an interview, you know, the, the panel would ask you sweet questions like, how soon would you be available to start? But then at the very end, you end up getting a, a regret, or maybe they don't even send the regret letter. But, you know, why is it that you have to ask that question at the very end of an interview? Because it's part of the questions that are stated in the interview sheet. I'm joking. We <laughs> <laughs> uh, asked that question because when you're um, when you are looking at uh, when we are interviewing you, we are probably three of us in the room, and because one, not one person makes the decision about whether you're successful or not, we we'll still need to discuss whether you're successful. So we don't know if. So it's me and Michael interviewing, and then. Um, I, I think that you're successful, but Michael doesn't think you're successful. We'll still need to debrief about that. So if we agree that you're successful, we'll need to know what your notice period is. So it's not necessarily, when somebody asks what your notice period is, it's not necessarily a job offer. It's just to check um, when you would be available. It's basically just for that. And then uh, should you be successful, then they have that in mind. Thank you. Um, there's some good compliments here from Susan, who's saying uh, this is a great session. Uh, good job to mostly me, but she's also mentioned your name, but good job to you too, Annelies. So thank you. Um, I think one of the brilliant questions here is, is from an anonymous person where they're saying, you know, there's a question that's often asked, what are your strengths and your weaknesses? How do you answer that? I can't, um, I'll say the truth. Honestly, honestly, uh, everyone has weaknesses, everyone has strengths. So the minute you start um, lying and, oh my gosh, do not give those uh, weaknesses like I'm a perfectionist. No, 
<laughs> no one is buying that. The same way that you don't buy it and you don't believe it and you had to go and look and say what you... Just say the truth. Um, if you're bad at receiving feedback, just say that you're bad at receiving feedback and it, you're trying to work at it and this is what you've been able to do so far. So talk about the things that you've been able to do to get over that weakness. But the, do not lie and do not give those cliche uh, weaknesses of I'm a perfectionist. Um, um because they don't fly and we don't believe you um and usually you will know that recruiters don't believe you or the interviewers don't believe you when they ask about the your previous feedback from your line manager be honest about it um that said don't be too honest and give too much detail on how bad it is or uh, don't give your worst weakness give the one that has been mentioned to you you're even self-aware about it and then um talk about what you've been doing about it because i hope that you're doing something about your weakness and having weaknesses is not necessarily a bad thing i'll just say that we are all human yes <laughs> so one question here again from an anonymous person they're asking um, what's the future in terms of recruitment? How has uh, this whole COVID situation affected human resources within organization? And how, what is the best way for one to position themselves to get a job? Um, the, uh, to be honest, uh, the, the recruitment space, uh, what has changed in it in terms of, I'll talk, just talk about first of all, demand and supply. Um, the supply is low. There are few, I mean, the demand is, uh, high. There are more people looking for jobs than there are jobs. So, and that's because of the economy and how that has been impacted. Uh, there are not very many firms hiring right now. Um, uh, in terms of the actual recruitment process of it, uh, most of it is now digital. I'm actually planning an assessment center. Assessment center is where you come and you're given uh, different um, tasks in a day, and it's going to be a virtual assessment center. So um, it's changing in that way. In terms of um, how to position yourself, uh, just as you've always positioned yourself, we are still recruiting human beings, uh, believe it or not. Um, uh, uh, the things that you need to invest in is obviously things that go, that have to do with virtual. So if you invited to especially a virtual interview, make sure you have a good connection, um, present yourself as you would in a normal interview, dress up um, and perform as you would on a face-to-face -face interview. Yeah, virtual doesn't mean that you now lower your standards. Uh, but otherwise, um, all the things that you are looking for uh, previously still remain. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the what has probably changed and will continue to change is that um, because the ways of working are changing, we might be the, the jobs that are currently in the market might also be changing. There might be more demand in certain jobs than there are in others. And that's just because of the nature of how the world is changing. But in terms of uh, how to present yourself, the same, the same way that you would before applies. Thank you. Um, Julie is also saying uh, awesome session, Asante Sana. Um, so thank you, thank you. Then um, one, one good question from uh, Abdul Kadir um, is asking, what about you know, in, a, in an interview situation, can you carry your computer and do, your, do a presentation of your CV? How do you see about that? So the thing about technology is it fails you at the time you need it the most. If you're going to carry a computer to make a presentation during your you during your interview, just know that you're taking a risk. Yeah. And not everyone might be impressed with that show. And because you don't know the people you're going to talk to, unless it's been requ required of you, don't do it. Yeah. Uh, that PowerPoint will shut down <laughs> or you know i don't know how computers work they usually shut down when you're in the middle of when you or when you want to make an impression so avoid that um then um on in terms of your in terms of the past people you're recruiting, not everyone is impressed by that. So just do what you're required to do. Um, don't uh, don't second guess or try to become uh, creative. It might actually be your downfall. 
Thank you. Um, so I'm seeing two more compliments here. Yeah? Um, Amelia saying thank you very much for the very informative and timely session. May God bless you. I didn't know your name is Nanu, so may God bless you, Nanu. <laughs> and then uh, Fidel is also saying such an awesome session. So thank you everyone for the brilliant feedback. I think let's just tackle one more question. Um, I see Tina is also saying very informative session. Thank you, Annelies. Um, thank you very much for the feedback, Tina. So I guess the last question that we'll just tackle in the minutes that we have is Marion is asking, she's an amateur in HR. Um, how can they choose or get a mentor in the HR space? Is there like a HR uh, support group, uh, you know, place where they can be able to reach out and get mentor? Um, have you done an internship? Um, that's the first place and that's the easiest place to get a mentor uh, because those people know you and they should be able to guide you. Um, that's the fastest, that's the easiest place to get a mentor. Uh, in terms of choosing a mentor, choose a mentor for the for what you're looking to get. If you want mentoring uh, because of your professional life, then you need to choose a professional mentor and somebody that you admire and you're comfortable getting uh, dirty with because mentoring is very, it's a vulnerable, uh, something that you do with all your boundaries down. Yeah, so make sure you get somebody that you're comfortable talking to and then also somebody who you admire and would be able to help um, you in that space. So I, ho I don't know if you've done a, a, an internship. Let's start from there. That would be a okay. good place to start looking. Cool. So you're basically saying, um, based on her, her networks, she can basically reach out to, to people within the HR space uh, where she's working for internships um, and then build on um, a much bigger network from there. So And sometimes not necessarily. More. So yeah. Sorry, I was saying not necessarily in HR, yeah, it could be there are people uh, who can mentor you out of their field. Out of the HR space, you mean? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Annelise. I think um, uh, just checking in case there is anything else. So I see one last question. Um, Peter is asking, how do you manage anxiety in an interview? Um, I think let's tackle that one and then we can close up the session. But thank you, everyone. Maybe just answer that last question. Okay, so first of all, um, anxiety is normal. You are not abnormal for being anxious. If you are not anxious, then I'd be worried for you. Anxiety is normal. Um, excessive anxiety is worrying. I've been in interviews where the candidates started crying or they were, they were sweating or um, they were not able to sit still. So how you manage anxiety for me i would say um is prepare prepare uh, prepare so practice read through your cv understand your cv anticipate all the questions that you could possibly get therefore you kind of you kind of have this control aspect that you know what is coming at you and you know what you're presenting and what you're all about. So that kind of kills anxiety to some extent. But otherwise, if you're not anxious, then there's something wrong. Either that job is not challenging enough for you or um, there's something wrong with you uh, attending that interview. So anxiety is not bad. Uh, just prepare to lessen the chances of it going overboard. I think one last thing that I'll add there is also maybe to get there on time because it allows you to kind of breathe in and not be, be feel rushed when you get into the interview. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe get in a few minutes early, um, mm. just have some time to, to breathe in, relax. I don't know if you want to take, uh, I see a, an, an interesting question here, which I think I really also want to know the answer to. So somebody anonymous is asking LinkedIn, how powerful is it in terms of positioning oneself? Uh, very powerful. Um, I'll tell you um, the number of some of most of the applications I've got, or most of the people I've had who have uh, approached me, have uh, have come from LinkedIn. Approached approach me for positions. That is, um, it is um, it is more important if you're an experienced hire 
because us recruiters use it all the time to recruit. So if I'm looking for um, marketing managers, it's very easy for me to go into LinkedIn and type in marketing managers in Kenya, and it will bring all these profiles of people that I can consider for the role. So yeah, um, LinkedIn is important. Um, more so if you're experienced, if you're starting out, it's good to have because I've also done some searches of uh, graduates from LinkedIn. Yeah. I think maybe the, the second part of the question is, is there a way to cheat on LinkedIn to appear at the top? Okay. <laughs> yes, <laughs> if you pay for the, um, if you pay for the premium uh, service, but uh, some of the, uh, I think you pay for the premium service if you're an experienced hire. Yeah, because for sure, experience has a sought after on LinkedIn. But if you're a graduate hire, that is just um, sort of going to add value. But if you're an experienced hire, you want to pay for that premium service. If you're really looking for a job, if you've gotten to that I conquered space, yeah, you want to pay for that. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you, everyone, as well. You have been an awesome audience. Um, I still see a lot of more questions that I wish we had more time to answer. I'm just respecting that we, we've shot by 30 minutes um, from what we expected for this session. So thank you, everyone. I guess uh, you know the fact that we have so many questions that are not unanswered means that you know people want to have you back and release, and we'd also love to, to host you again. So thank you very much for that. Um, seeing some good compliments coming in, uh, people saying this was a good session. They're saying you know, they're happy they become more experienced after this session. So thank you very much. And thank you for everyone for being such an attentive audience. It's not easy to have 50 plus people in a, in a session and uh, all engaged and participating. So thank you very much, everyone. And do have yourselves a good evening. Have a good evening. Good night. Thanks so much, Michael, for hosting me. All right. I had a good, good night, time guys. interacting with all of you. Bye. Bye.